it's uh, eight thirty sharp. Uh, so we'll um, start in a moment. Let's wait uh, a couple of minutes more uh, that uh, people uh, jump in. So in the meanwhile, uh, uh, good morning to people from uh, France and good afternoon to people from Singapore and good, uh, I don't know what, for everybody else. I don't know where people are, are exactly, mostly from Europe or East Asia. Um, so we will uh, start soon the uh, third and final uh, session of this uh, teaser workshop that, as you know, now replaces the uh, HPC uh, School on Quantum Computational Material Science. So, uh, well, it's still not fully morning here in Paris, but uh, it looks it's gonna be a sunny day, which is, uh, which is not the case all the time for here, this, this part of the world, so it's, uh, it's great. Okay, so people are jumping in. Marco, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, do you want to make some announcement for, for next year's school? Because it's the last uh, session. Yes. Right? Great. Yes, 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 of course. I, I will probably, uh, uh, my, my idea would be to do some kind of uh, final remarks, concluding okay. remarks at the session. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, we can uh, start to say something. So first of all, yes, as uh, my uh, co-organizer, uh, uh, Christian, uh, reminds me, this has been the last day of this uh, uh, teaser workshop. Uh, as you've seen, it's uh, in between. A, a, a school and a, a real uh, conference. So uh, all the all speakers so far, and I'm sure they will do even better today, were very good in trying to uh, be pedagogical at the start because there are uh, a lot of uh, students and uh, PhD students and uh, uh, postdocs here. And so, um, but then also try to uh, show a flavor of uh, their uh, hong, uh, hop, usually ongoing research. So uh, that's going to be uh, hopefully a good way to uh, tease you uh, to uh, join and participate to the actual school that will take place again either in uh, Paris, uh, in general, uh, generally the last week of August, and in Singapore will be pretty much this time of the year. Of course, you will be uh, keep uh, updated about the details. We have your mails and stuff, so everything is going to, you'll, you'll find the information, but please take note, if uh, COVID disappears, as we all hope, we, there will be uh, the uh, Advanced Computational Material Science School in Paris uh, last week of August, and the uh, HPC School on Quantum Computational Material Science here, here there, in Singapore uh, in uh, November. Okay, so Marco, Marco, just a minute, or maybe you want yeah. to keep it for the final remarks. But I think that it's nice also that you, you detail a bit uh, the, the structure of the school, you know, having the lectures in the morning and the hands on uh, sessions in the afternoon. Yes, okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, the, the both schools, since they have been uh, conceived uh, from the same people. Uh, they are structured uh, such a way that they are uh, five days, so they run over a week. In the morning, typically you have uh, two sessions, one general session, for example, DFT, uh, precisely the, a more developed uh, part of what I uh, uh, said uh, yesterday morning. And then a second uh, morning session, which is more advanced. For example, it could be, I don't know, DMFT, the one uh, stuff that you saw from uh, Benjamin Lenz uh, uh, later yesterday, again, developed as a lecture, not as a uh, research application. And then in the afternoon, uh, uh, we build some um, tutorials. So hands-on uh, computer tutorials in which we are, uh, there are uh, mini projects on the specific advanced part that you saw in the morning. So for example, uh, to keep the, the, the electronic structure uh, I, uh, example, DFT first, then see uh, dynamical mean field theory later, the computer tutorial will be based on uh, dynamical mean field theory, which is the advanced part. We, uh, the FT part will be just a reminder for a sort of reminder, general reminder for everybody. And so this is gonna be the same for all sessions. We'll have a, a, a molecular dynamics session first, follow uh, one day, one of the days, followed by an, uh, an unsampling uh, session, which will uh, look 
a lot, uh, which the, the more developed part of what uh, Fabio De Ducci will say later on. Uh, and then uh, uh, well, going on, we'll have uh, machine learning, Quantum Monte Carlo, uh, um, something uh, that you will see today with Laura and then with uh, Mathieu, uh, more about uh, how to predict properties of uh, electrodes and uh, so batteries and so forth and so on. So that's the, the general idea, the general uh, picture of both schools. The, again, there are sister schools, the Paris one and the Singapore one. So I don't know, Christian, if you, and the idea of course is to, we spend one week together. We, so we stay, we have lunch together, we have dinner together, we have social events, uh, hopefully even uh, some uh, more fun than uh, coffee breaks, beer breaks. And uh, uh, we, there will be some social parts, so uh, there's also gonna be a, a, a fun moment. Wine and cheese. Exactly. Being very French, uh, wine and cheese will be will be thrown out all over the place. Or oh, pizza. Haha, <laughs> Dario. Uh, <laughs> yes, but I mean, don't trust a French pizza ever. Let me tell you. <laughs> I, I agree, I trust. agree. Yeah. I don't know about Singapore pizza, but don't trust French pizza. Okay, don't, don't trust uh, wine and uh, cheese from Italy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blasphemy. Uh, Italy has some good red wine. Yes, and, and <laughs> yes, also pro, pro, Prosecco is also white wine. is very good. So uh, Christian is uh, I don't know is, is drunk already. So it's, uh, that's why it's not, not nonsense. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go to work. Uh, and it's a big pleasure for me to introduce this session. As you've seen, the idea of these three days is that we started from uh, very quantum uh, systems in which everything is focused on the electronic part. And then, and so the uh, hard quantum treatment of the electronic properties. Yesterday, we were a little bit in between in the sense that we started to introduce atoms, real atoms. So uh, the electronic part can be treated at the DFT level, at the DMFT level, uh, or with some approximation and stuff, but still there's a more focus on the physics of materials. Today, the focus, uh, we, we go, we forget more and more about the electrons, even if they're of course very important. And we start with something we saw already yesterday with, uh, for example, with Ari Saitsonen. Uh, today, we go deeper into the real problem of uh, real uh, material science, material science uh, uh, researchers that you have to uh, synthesize to create materials or even if you have already your materials, a material this may have defects and stuff. In, in, in a broad sense, you have to um, uh, take into account thermodynamics and so to uh, thermodynamics and so uh, chemistry because uh, chemistry occurs whenever you have a finite temperature and atoms and molecules and, and, and physical systems are uh, allowed by uh, thermal activity uh, the, to move, to move around. So to sample uh, configurational space, spaces. So that's why uh, today we call the session uh, um, uh, computational materials chemistry, because uh, again, uh, chemistry is an essential uh, feature, an essential part of uh, uh, computational uh, material science uh, theoretical side. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the, uh, I think the youngest, uh, speaker of the all the workshop, Laura Scalfi. She is a, she's a third year, if I'm not wrong, PhD student uh, at the Phoenix Laboratory in uh, Sorbonne University, working with uh, Benjamin Rottenberg, who's one of the pillars of our uh, collaborations, of our uh, collaborations both on the school and in the Maestro uh, uh, Consortium. And so it's also worth noticing that. Uh, uh, Laura uh, came from uh, come from uh, the Ecole Normale, so she, she's uh, uh, one of the uh, product of the French excellence, and she will uh, be presenting us today her work on the semi-classical uh, Thomas Fermi model to tune the metallicity of electrodes in classical simulations. So, Laura, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yes, so. I am uh, in the Laboratoire Phoenix, and we, as you said, we are we do physical chemistry, uh, especially of electrolytes and any nanosystem with electrolytes and interfaces. What I will present today is a part of my PhD, 
um, which is which uses classical simulations of electrodes. And uh, today, it's the focus is about how we introduced um, a semi-classical model, which is a Thomas Fermi model, in our classical simulations to be able to tune the metallicity of our electrodes. So I will first start by just uh, showing you an overview of what we do usually to simulate metallic interfaces and uh, electrodes in molecular simulations. And then I will show you this uh, improvement that we made on our um, simulations. So we are usually focused on systems that look like this. This is a uh, capacitors. We, um, these capacitors are used for electric energy storage or any uh, energy storage applications. For example, here you have uh, an ionic liquid sandwiched between two graphite electrodes. You have here a positive electrode with a positive charge uh, on one side and a neg negative electrode on the other side. You can have water electrolytes, you can have ionic liquids, molten salts, any real system that you want. What we, what's important for us in simulations is, first of all, we need to have a finite temperature. For molten salts, we are, we are going up to thousands of Kelvin. So we really need some, to sample configurations, and we, we do this using molecular dynamics. The second thing, is that we are usually dealing with very large systems. We, are, we need about 10,000s or uh, hundreds of thousands of atoms. And also, we want to focus on long time scales uh, on the range of several nanoseconds, because we want to be able to sample diffusion of the species. Imagine uh, that you want to see ions diffusing towards the negative electrodes or positive electrodes and this takes time, or also uh, maybe some adsorption processes on the surface. So for this, we need to something that is fast, and we're using classical force fields that, are, that work well for uh, bulk ionic liquids to, um, to model these systems. However, as you said, uh, we still need to be able to, uh, to have electrons here, because we're using, we're modeling metallic interfaces, and so we need to be able to account for electronic polarizations at the surface and at the interface. This will allow not only first to have good boundary conditions for our electrolytes, so what happens at the interface uh, will, will uh, impact the properties of the electrolyte, and also this will allow us to compute uh, the charge induced on the surface, and from that, the capacitance of the capacitors, which is one of the main interests uh, that we want to predict for our simulations. So these systems are systems where we both need statistical mechanics and statistical physics uh, to have a good sampling of the, the systems, but also quantum chemistry to have a good description of the interface. I want to point out that uh, contrary to maybe earlier talks, we are more focusing on the electrolyte side, side and the properties of the electrolyte than on really accurately um, describing the material of the electrolyte, of the electrolyte. So how do we do this? Well, classical molecular dynamics, we know, um, force fields, they are already done. How do we account for electronic polarization in these simulations? We usually have constant potential simulations. What are these? Um, I have this, uh, this is the usual system. This is sodium chloride uh, in water sandwich between two electrodes, a positive electrode and a negative electrode. And we, what we usually have in classical simulations is static point charges that do not move. Uh, so usually here you would have zero charge anywhere on the surface. However, what we do is to we add fluctuating charges, and in this case, Gaussian charges. So you have an, the amplitude of the Gaussian that will change with time. These fluctuations are not random. They are they, they're, uh, controlled by a constant potential constraint. So this means that the total energy of our system, uh, the derivative of the total energy with respect to the set of charges, of fluctuating charges, is set to be equal to uh, a constant electric potential. So this equation has to be solved at each time step, and which gives us um, Q star here, the set of charges that we're going to have for each different time step. 
We can solve this using minimization algorithms, so minimizing this function. Or we can do, we can use the fact that the, the energy here is quadratic in the charges. And so we know um, we can solve this by doing a matrix inversion, where our set of charges for each time step is a product of uh, the inverse of the, this matrix, which contains electrode electrode interactions, uh, times B, the electrode electrolyte interaction vector, and plus psi, the electric potential vector. What we usually use as psi, the electric potential vector, is we put um, the same potential, electric potential, on all the atoms of the top electrode, the same potential on all, on all the atom of the bottom electrode, and then what we apply is a difference of potential in between the two electrodes. So what we obtain is uh, induced charges, and they are going to uh, respond uh, over time to the, external, to the external medium. So for example, if you have here lithium ion in purple, you will um, induce a negative charge on the surface, which is localized on the surface. This is the blue, um, the blue color here. On the other side, if you have more complex systems, such as this electrolyte, you will also induce charges on one side and the other side of the electrode. The main effect is that if you have a potential difference, you will first accumulate some charge, some net charge on one side and the opposite charge on the other side. So these are the blue and red colors on your atoms. But if you see, you also have fluctuations uh, on the surface. This is not a homogeneous uh, charging. And these fluctuations are due to the configurations of the, the electrolyte. So for example, if you have a water molecule that goes a bit uh, further from the surface or uh, closer from the surface, you will have a different response. And this is a very dynamic system. So these simulations have been used for several decades now. And I, would, I just want to point out one application. Then uh, later on, Mathieu Saran will probably show you more. Um, this is something where they use this uh, constant potential simulations to simulate capacitors for blue energy and desalination purposes. Uh, this is devices to capture energy when you mix uh, river water, so pure water, with salty water from, uh, from the sea. And you use here uh, nanoporous carbon electrodes with a concentrated sodium chloride uh, electrolyte. And they were able to show here using these techniques how the capacitance, uh, predict capacitances, and how it is related to the environment of the ions inside the, the electrodes. So now I just want to do a, a small parenthesis, a highlight on, um, on the part on uh, statistical mechanics and charge fluctuations in these systems. What we're usually interested in is the total uh, charge on, that we can accumulate on one side, on one electrode, when we apply a potential difference. And we can usually look at the mean charge that we accumulate. However, we are also interested in the fluctuations of this charge because uh, we, there is what we call the differential capacitance. That is something that you can measure in experiments. That is the derivative of this charge with respect to the potential difference. And this, we can show that there is a fluctuation dissipation the theorem relation that relates this to fluctuations of the total charge on the electrodes. And what we figured out is that in our simulations, we are using born oppenheimer sampling because for each configuration of the ion, we only have one charge, one set of charges that correspond. There are no, um, no fluctuations around the, the minimum. We always go to, to the minimum. This means that the born oppenheimer sampling suppresses some of the fluctuations. And therefore, when, we're, when what we want to measure are the fluctuations, we should take care. And we, we can demonstrate that you need to add a correction to this capacitance, something like 5% of the total, the total capacitance. And we also show that we can, you can compute this correction and it corresponds to the capacitance of the empty capacitor. So the same electrodes, no, no electrolytes in the middle. This is just if you're planning on doing maybe a machine learning and having DFT with larger um, system sizes and uh, longer time scales, this is something maybe you want to, to think about. 
So back to uh, the topic of the talk, we, we showed you how we can do metallic interfaces. We wanted to go a bit beyond and do non-ideal metals. This is because there have been some experimental measurements at the ENS at the, in the physics department, where uh, the, the, the authors of this paper took the surface and an ionic liquid drop and confined this drop using an AFM tip. And what they saw is that at some height of confinement, which is called lambda s here, you observe freezing. This is not surprising. This is known because at some when you confine your liquid, at some point the the how do you say the the surface terms will play a role with respect to the volume terms, and this will shift your um, um, your phase transition. Sorry. And so, what was surprising, however, is that when you change the surface. This, uh, this lambda s changes radically. So you go from 10 nanometers to something like 100 nanometers, 100 nanometers. And this seems to correspond to an increase in conductivity. So for mica, which is insulator, and for platinum, which is conductor. And the authors here show this effect of what we call the metallicity on electrolyte properties. They use the Thomas Fermi model on dot, the dot, dotted line here to explain uh, this change and this change in properties. So what we wanted to do is add this flavor to our simulations because for now we can do the very ins the, in the insulator part. We can do the metallic part. We, would, we, we were not able to do this uh, intermediate metallic uh, material. So just visually what we want is to have something where for the perfect metal, you have a very localized, um, induced charge, whereas for something like the Thomas Fermi metal, you have a screening that's larger and slower in, uh, in length scale. And so you have here something that goes deeper, a charge that goes deeper in the surface and on the sides. And this is characteristic, uh, this is characterized by the screening length within the material, which is called the Thomas Fermi length. So what we did was taking the, the, the simple description of the electronic structure uh, we, that is the Thomas Fermi model, and we try to implement it in our classical model. This is basically a local density approximation, and we took the kinetic energy from the, the electron gas. We discretize it because we have discrete atoms on our systems, and then we expand it to the second order in powers of the charge. Here. So we obtain for each electrode something a Thomas Fermi energy that looks like this. We have a constant term that depends on the Fermi level. Uh, we have a linear term in the charges and then a quadratic term that depends on the Thomas Fermi length. So we have all these, uh, we have introduced these values and especially this screening length of the material that we want to be able to tune. And this is the, the, y, the x axis on that you were, that uh, was shown before on the experimental graph. So when you combine the two electrodes uh, energies and the classical energy that we had before, and you enforce electron neutrality, which means that the total, uh, our total electrochemical cell is electron neutral, you obtain this. So a, a constant term that doesn't really matter for our purposes and um, a quadratic term that depends on this Thomas Fermi length, D is the atomic density and the charges. So in practice, this is a very easy to implement model because the only thing that changes is this term. And it's actually only a diagonal element in the matrix A that I showed you before, the electrode electrode interactions. So there's no big change to do on the code. This, is almost, this has almost no extra cost. And if you're using conjugate gradient, it actually uh, accelerates the convergence because the, we think that our functions are better behaved. So we just did it. And the first thing we wanted to look at is the empty capacitors. It's the, the easiest capacitor that you can look at. It's just a gold electrode and another gold electrode with nothing in between and the potential difference of one volt. What we look at is the charge in of each plane of uh, atoms divided by the total charge and this is the the charge that we obtain so you really see the effect of the screening length 
the higher the Thomas Fermi length, the longer the screening, and exactly the smaller the Thomas Fermi length, the smaller the screening. And the, the solid lines here that you see are analytical predictions. So the, the agreement is very good. We have also an, an analytical prediction for the capacitance uh, that we compute as being the total charge divided by the potential, so one volt. And this analytical prediction says that you can take the ideal cap uh, capacitance, which is uh, L, the difference, the, the size here of the, the capacitor, divided by epsilon zero. And you can sandwich it in between two Thomas Fermi, um, Thomas Fermi capacitors, which correspond one to the left electrode, one to the right electrode, in which this time you would use an LTF as the length of the capacitor. And we computed this and it works very well. So after this, we went to electrochemical cells where we actually have real systems. This is sodium chloride again in water with cold electrodes. And what I show you here is the electric potential. And once again, you see there is a significant uh, impact on the electric potential and you see the screening again with respect to the Thomas Fermi length. So the higher Thomas Fermi length, the longer the screening. And once again, we compute the capacitance here. These are the red dots. The first thing I would like to show you is that you go from three microfarad per centimeter square to something like one. So there is a quantitative difference uh, and dependence on this screening length of the capacitance, which is one of the things that we're looking at most. And the second thing is that we try to do this uh, approximation as before, where we sandwich the ideal with the ideal metal capacitance in between two Thomas Fermi capacitors. And these are the red, the black dots here. And you actually are doing something like 20, 10 to 20% of error. So this means that the interplay be between your electrolyte and your electrode is actually playing a really big role. And you can't just treat it as a, a correction after, after this. Now, just to give you orders of magnitude, the, your platinum good metals like platinum are somewhere here. Non-ideal metals like graphite are to be here and insulators are at the infinite side on this side. So back to our uh, experiments, we, we were looking, we want to look at confined phase transitions and what changes in confined phase transition Phase transition is the is the interface and the fact that you have an interface. So what we want to compute in this case is surface tension, uh, because this is what uh, what is going to tell you uh, the the interface, how the, the energetics of the interface. Indeed, the surface tension is a free energy per surface area, and this is how, how we will going to compute this. We will compute the free energy difference associated with a change in metallicity. Uh, meaning that we're going to take as a reference the ideal metal, so LTF equals zero. And, uh, and uh, from this ideal metal to we're going, we are integrating up to uh, non-ideal metal with some finite LTF. And so we do this using thermodynamic integration. You can use the partition functions you, that are described in the that, are, that we have to use in the constant potential ensemble, and we can figure out an analytical expression for these things. And here I will just like to show you first uh, a comparison with contact angles that maybe are more um, you're more familiar with. And so we measured contact angles, and then we can relate uh, free energies, surface tensions, and contact angles theta using the Young equation here. What we did our first measurements of contact angles. These are drop simulations. So we just had a drop of our electrolyte on a, on a very big uh, electrode. And you can obtain contact angles by running this drop and uh, averaging over the simulation and having density profiles. So then you do some trigonometry and get the, the contact angle. We did this for the two systems. We had one insulating system where all the charges were zero on the surface. And then the perfect metal, the ideal metal case, where you have here, uh, you can see negative, uh, some negative charge, some positive charge and fluctuations under the drop. 
I only plot here a quarter of the drop, but you can imagine where the rest is. And what we obtain is a measurable difference of contact angles of about four degrees. This is not much, but it's a measurable difference only because only due to the electronic polarization of the, surf of the surface. If you want to think about in terms of, uh, of surface tensions, uh, the difference in surface tension is about eight millinewton per meter, which you would compare, for example, to you know, the surface tension of the liquid vapor interface here, which is about 60 millinewtons per meter. So this is not a small effect. It's a small, but it's a, it's a significant effect, a measurable effect. And actually, the more metallic the surface is, the more hydrophilic, hydrophilic it gets. In the end, we compare this to our thermodynamic integration results. Uh, I want to point out that these are results at zero volt. So we just um, plug uh, just a, a wire uh, from one, system, one electrode to the other. And so you don't, you're not uh, putting any uh, potential difference in between. And we have, these are the dots that we obtained the values that we obtain and uh, an interpolation model that's uh, to be able to interpolate at larger Thomas Fermi lengths. The first thing is that when you compare the infinite value, the asymptotic value, it corresponds really well to our asymptotic value from drop simulation that I showed you just before. And so this, is, uh, this validates our approach. And the second thing is that here you can see we obtained uh, exactly the the dependence on the metallicity of this contact angle and of our surface tension. So in the end, this Thomas Fermi model allowed us to improve our constant potential simulations um, using some flavor of quantum chemistry. Um, and we obtained like this good analytical results for the NP capacitors and impact, significant impact on electrolyte and interfacial properties such as capacitance. I didn't show you, but also on the structure is changed and the dynamics of the cell uh, of the electrolyte of change and now on the surface tension. We hope that this model will allow us to have better prediction of capacitances for real systems. And now that we, I showed you uh, applications of this thermodynamic integration for liquid vapor interfaces, um, I would like to do it for solid liquid transitions as in the, the experiments. Before ending just a small advertisement, all these calculations are done with the metal walls code. It's a software of classical molecular dynamics, uh, especially designed to do uh, electrochemical systems. And we will have the slides. So if you, it's open source uh, on, on GitLab here. And I would like to thank Thomas Dufis, the postdoc that started uh, this project. Benjamin Rottenberg, my PhD advisor, and Mathieu Salan, who would supervise this work. And which is the main contributor to MetalWorks. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Laura. A very, very, really beautiful talk, uh, very pedagogical. So uh, I'll take uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, either by uh, chat or by voice. They're not shy, hopefully. Or otherwise, I'll start uh, the dance because I, I have a, a, a few questions. So I'll start first, so to, to people uh, this uh, morning shyness. Okay, my first question is, when you do the, the development in, uh, of the Thomas Fermi energy, the UTF uh, with the charges, can you, can you put it back, please? Uh, I'd, I'd like to, yes, here. So, uh, um, so you do this development, what, is, what are uh, uh, numbers that you have from theory or whatever, and what are numbers that you have to, are there any parameters here that you have to fit somehow? Or, or, or? Um, so actually we don't, um, in the simulations, uh, you mean in the simulations? Yes. Yeah. We have, so this uh, term actually, we're not using it in simulations. Uh, because what we what we really want is not the energy; it's the it's the energy to be able to have uh, the set of charges. So in the okay. end, uh, we only care about uh, the derivative of this with respect to the charges. So this mm -hmm. is the only term that the quadratic term is the only term that is it actually interesting for us. This is true only if we have the same 
electrodes, the same kind of electrodes on one side and on the other side, uh, okay. because otherwise this doesn't uh, apply. And so what we need is the density, uh, the atomic density. So this is we only take the, the atomic density and the Thomas Fermi length. Uh, we use this, we extract this from the density of states. Um, and uh, if there's not other uh, questions, I'll keep uh, uh, firing. Um, so uh, I mean, uh, I didn't, I don't understand uh, if your um, how your results. If you compare straightforwardly your results to uh, Derek Bocquet's results, or I mean, I, I didn't really. I mean, I, I saw the comparison of your calculation with the model, but not with experimental data. Uh, or, or maybe I missed it. No. So uh, these results are for crystallization of the freezing of the mm -hmm. ionic fluids. Um, there's two things. For now, I only did uh, liquid vapor. So in some yeah. kind of sense, because so I just simulated liquids, and what I didn't show you is that I simulated vacuum, which I take to okay. the uh, And so this is when I when you do the Young equation, you're comparing uh, the wall wall liquids and wall vapor sites. Uh, mm -hmm. To compare to these uh, experiments, uh, you need to do the liquid phase and the solid phase. Okay. So for now, uh, actually, I'll... so because my next question is, uh, uh, how can you uh, comp I don't know if you did or uh, did you or how can you compare your results with uh, experimental data which are specific on what you uh, calculated? Um, so the, the the direct link is doing uh, it's what we call the Gibbs Thompson equation. So mm -hmm. it tells you that. Um, so there's two ways of saying this, but basically the temperature shift that you have uh, in your um, for your system in your phase transition is related is proportional to one over the the confinement height, so one over lambda s. Um, so here we have a constant temperature. So this is the, the lambda s is changing. And the prefactor in this Gibbs Thompson equation is directly proportional to the difference in surface tension. And with some other bulk, uh, the density, the, um, the entropy. Um, and so this is why we're really interested in surface tension, because then when we get this difference in surface tension, we obtain directly, the, we're supposed to obtain directly the change in the phase transition temperature or uh, confinement height. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there, uh, there yes, other? I have, I have a question. Yes. In, in on, fact, I, I have, my question is uh, more or less inviting Martin, uh, who is attending, to, to step in in a way. Uh, okay, uh, just briefly, because Martin has is, is been working here on Thomas Fermi uh, approximation and going beyond Thomas Fermi approximation and the so called gradient approxim uh, gradient correction to Thomas Fermi and you know, whatever. Okay, so. Uh, so are you, have you explored going beyond the Thomas Fermi or not? Um, so for us, um, the, 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 the reason, no, because for us, the first step was a Thomas Fermi model. Yes. So, but I think why not? I don't see. But, okay, I'll say my question is different. Okay, with Thomas Fermi, you are absolutely happy or, or, or you think that going beyond it, you, you would be better, much better? Um, I, I don't know. The thing is, uh, we should still take into account that we are doing classical simulations and there are so many other things that um, could go wrong, uh, if, you, if you see what I mean. And so maybe having a really, really uh, fine uh, and going towards more complicated um, theories could help, but maybe it's not uh, the first priority. That's what I understand. I mean. For example, um, this, an example, our atoms in the electrodes are frozen. Mm -hmm. So maybe before going uh, even steps and maybe doing more accurate uh, electronics, oh, the first thing would be maybe first to try to make them move. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions?
Uh, well, if not, uh, I'd like to thank Laura, uh, Laura again, because it was a really beautiful talk. And I'll uh, switch to the uh, next speaker, uh, who, if I'm not wrong, should be uh, Fabio Tedrucci. Hello, everyone. Hello, Fabio. So can you please uh, start to uh, share uh, your uh, screen? Yes. So in the meanwhile, I can introduce Fabio. Fabio is a colleague, a professor here at Sorbonne University in my own lab. So I actually mentioned him several times yesterday uh, here at the uh, Institute of uh, uh, Mineralogy, Physics of Materials and Cosmochemistry. And uh, he will present us uh, his uh, lecture on free energy calculation of chemical reactions uh, in solution. So please, Fabio, the stage is yours. Uh, I'll give you a sign, make a sign after 20 minutes. Okay, then... so thank you, Marco, for the, yep. Okay, thanks a lot. So I'd like to thank uh, all the organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning or afternoon, maybe, in Singapore. Uh, I will uh, give you a quick overview of uh, some basic concepts about free energy calculations and uh, some developments we did recently, uh, specifically to tackle chemical reactions in solution. I will show some more broad classes of systems and problems, but, but uh, um, uh, this is uh, maybe the main topic. So uh, let me see, yes. So this is a general slide that I like to show in the beginning because uh, we can focus, of course, on a specific process on a specific problem like a chemical reaction or ice nucleation or a protein folding. But uh, it would be even better if we could address uh, many of these problems at the same time and uh, in a unified way from the computational viewpoint. So at first sight, these systems are very different, of course, and these problems are very different. But uh, of course, they are all uh, concerning con condensed matter and uh, we can broadly characterize them as transformations, structural transitions, if you want, in condensed matter. So after all, the Hamiltonian behind all these objects are similar, right? They're atoms and electrons. And uh, then we can hope maybe uh, to, to study them in a kind of unified way without having to specialize a lot on each single system. This is a little bit the, the outline, if you want, of the, of the presentation. Uh, when I speak of studying transformations, uh, of course, there are different levels. Uh, at the first level, we would like to understand what are the structures that are concerned. So, uh, the starting and, and end points of the transformation, the transition states and so on. Uh, then there are quantitative information we can hope to extract in the form of free energies. Uh, we will see what I mean about with that. And uh, also in the form of kinetics, so kinetic rates typically. So all these steps uh, in principle require different approaches and, and can, uh, can be difficult to, to achieve. So maybe, uh, maybe we need a uh, further work of motivation, a further word of motivation. So after all, why is it important to simulate transformations? Uh, we could use experiments. We could, uh, I mean, is, is it really important? <clears throat> well, there is a first reason, in my opinion. Transition pathways are by nature evanescent in the sense that uh, when, when you have a transition, uh, I don't know, a phase transition or a chemical reaction, uh, maybe you have to wait years to observe it because it's a rare event, okay? There is a high barrier and... Uh, it takes a lot of time to be observed, but once the system decides by a random fluctuation to perform the transition, the transition itself is extremely fast. So uh, typically in, a, in, a, in experiments, you can miss it. You can miss the, the event, uh, I mean, the, the, really the, 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 the fast, uh, quick transition, uh, which takes maybe a few picoseconds, a few nanoseconds. So this is by nature, this kind of transition pathways are, are difficult to catch in experiments uh, and therefore simulations can help. Another reason uh, why uh, it can be interesting to, do, to simulate these, uh, these processes is that uh, we can uh, hope to directly access free energy landscapes and kinetic rates, as I said before. And these are quantities that are not always trivial to, to measure experimentally once again. And then a third reason that, I, that I, I, I tend to focus on is that nowadays we have a gap between predictions we can do, uh, for example, of crystal structures or, you know, wonderful materials with, uh, with uh, great properties. We heard uh, several talks in these days, or maybe very complex molecules that are very, very, that have very important functions. So I don't know, drugs or, uh, or other molecules. 
But then are we able to synthesize them? This is another story, okay? We need some recipes to synthesize them. And, uh, and if you look into experiments, this, is, this, is a, this looks a bit like kitchen recipes, okay? Uh, it's, it's not to, to attack experiments. It's great what they do. It's simply, if you read uh, what they write in the papers, uh, typically it seems they follow some trial and error procedures. They, they try to learn uh, by mistakes and change parameters until they can achieve a synthesis. So this means maybe we need to learn more from the theoretical side and uh, to become really able to predict uh, synthesis recipes and also to help our colleagues uh, doing experiments. Overall, there is a fundamental puzzle behind all of this, which is the competition between thermodynamics and kinetics. We all know very well that uh, in nature around us, even in the lab, very often we do not observe the, the objects, I don't know, the systems, or the configurations which are the most stable, which are the thermodynamically good ones. But very often we observe metastable states that are trapped perhaps for millions of, year, millions of years, okay? Think to graphite and diamond, think to uh, proteins, think to, I mean, um, there are many, many examples, okay? You, you can observe that uh, all around us, basically systems are seldom actually at equilibrium. Uh, fortunately, for example, for living beings is fundamental to be out of equilibrium. So again, can we understand uh, the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics? Now, uh, just a couple of examples. This is, this is from our colleague, Stefan Klotz in our lab. Uh, they try to synthesize in, uh, in different complicated ways uh, some amorphous ices. And if you read, uh, if you read uh, in the method sections or in the description of how they do it in practice, it's kind of complicated, okay? You have to warm for half an hour, you have to compress. If you, if you first warm and then compress, uh, you observe one thing. If you exchange the order, you observe another thing. So here again, it's important. To, it would be important to understand the kinetics, the, the transition pathways and so on. Another example is here from another colleague, Alexander Kurakevich, again in our lab. Uh, it's the synthesis of this complicated uh, allotrope containing uh, sodium and silicon. And if you read again in the method section, it's, it's quite interesting. It's really a sort of kitchen recipe, okay? We have to heat at this temperature for this time. We have to compress. Again, this points to uh, the fact that maybe we need to understand better the theory behind it. We, we need to be able to predict these things uh, if we want really to be helpful for experimental people. Another example for chemistry. So I, I'm not a chemist as a disclaimer, but it seems that the synthesis of the B12 vitamin, for example, was like, exceptionally complicated and it required uh, really a lot of steps and uh, I can imagine a, a huge lot of work from a number of PhD students, postdocs, and so on. So this again tells us that to go from A to B, we have a very complicated path with many possible side pathways, and uh, we must find a way to to help experimentalists to 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 predict uh, what, what is the best way to achieve their goal. Okay. Now, in principle, um, it is relatively straightforward to. To, to, to do simulations of this kind. We, we have to generate transition pathways. We have to sample. Uh, so so this is the first step, okay? If you, if you do not have transition pathways, uh, well, uh, it's hard, you can do anything uh, further, right? So first of all, you have to generate transition pathways and we could use molecular dynamics, for example. It's an excellent technique to try to have an in silico microscope, okay? To reproduce uh, uh, really the microscopic behavior of matter with a good precision, uh, if you have a good force field, of course. So we could just let the simulation go and observe the transition pathways. Then once we have good transition pathways, we could just sample them a lot. I mean, uh, I collect a lot of statistics along these pathways until uh, obtaining equilibrium distributions. For example, we, have a, we can project the dynamics on a, uh, on a collective variable, on a, on a reaction coordinate as it is called often. So it's a generalized coordinate that is able to track the progress of the transition. Uh, I will say more in a moment. And then once we project the dynamics, uh, the very complicated dynamics onto this variable, we can observe the equilibrium distribution of this variable. And uh, this gives us the free energy. So why not? This is just accumulation of sampling, right? You, you sample a lot. And then even better, you can, uh, you can access kinetic rates. To access kinetic rates, uh, well, there are different ways. You can do it brute force. You can try to model with the Langevin equation as it is shown here, or perhaps with the master equation. So, I will, uh, I will not enter into details, but this is a very active field of research uh, at present, okay? Now, 
there is a problem, of course. Uh, this would be nice if we, if we could do directly all these things. The problem is that these are, as I said in the beginning, these are rare events, okay? Uh, phase transitions, chemical reactions, protein folding. All these problems are characterized by a very slow time scale, which is depicted if you want. So the problem is depicted in this a simple scheme. If we project the dynamics, as I said, on a reaction coordinate, the system spends a huge lot of time in the metastable states. Here there are two, for example, A and B. And then very rarely it performs a jump. And the jump is quick. You see that the, the trajectory of the jump is almost vertical. But again, we have to wait a lot of time. <clears throat> So here is an example at how the how a small barrier actually of a few kcal, few tens of kcal per mole can bring you to a time scale that is a billion years, okay, easily. You, you switch from one minute to one billion years just by, by going from 20 to 40 kcal per mole of barrier. So we cannot use a plain molecular dynamics, brute force molecular dynamics. There are a number of techniques which can be used instead. And uh, this is these are two examples. I took them because uh, they are very widespread today, and uh, so umbrella sampling actually is a bit the mother of, uh, of many other techniques. And metadynamics is something more modern that uh, has been used really a lot in recent years. But these are just two examples. Okay, you, you have different techniques, uh, also different philosophies. In these two techniques, in these two that I show here, uh, the main idea is that uh, we can cheat a bit. We can supplement uh, an external bias, an external uh, force, if you want, or an external potential energy. In addition to the one of our system, to the, to the real one, let's say, we can supplement, as I said, uh, an extra energy. If uh, we design this potential energy or these forces in a smart way, this will help us to accelerate the transitions, okay? Uh, in metadynamics, this is kind of intuitive. Uh, you, you feel uh, locally the free energy minima, uh, again, projected on a reaction coordinate, by adding uh, along your simulation iteratively, you add from time to time, I don't know, every picosecond, a small repulsive Gaussian, okay? You add uh, an extra energy, if you want, in the shape of a Gaussian as a function of your reaction coordinate. And this you do regularly, I don't know, every picosecond. And this will automatically fill uh, the local free energy minima and bring your system to overcome the barriers. When you fill the completely a minimum, like you, you filled it with water, basically the barrier disappears for the system and then is able to perform a transition very quickly. Uh, at the end of all this process, if you run long enough and, uh, and if you don't have troubles and your system is well behaved and so on, there, there are many if in reality, well, you feel a bit all the available profile, all the interesting free energy profile, you feel all the well, and the, the, the added bias uh, basically is a good indication of the shape of the free energy, okay? So you don't know in advance the, the free energy landscape, but you, you reconstruct it iteratively by adding these repulsive Gaussians and by keeping track, of course, of the, of the shape of the extra potential, of the bias potential, okay? This is a simple idea, it's very effective. Umbrella sampling is a kind of similar idea, but it's not a time-dependent uh, bias, okay? And, uh, the difference with metadynamics. It's a static bias, typically you have parabolas to, to keep things simple. You can uh, apply parabolas at different positions in your reaction coordinate space and then you can localize uh, the sampling. So you can localize the molecular dynamic simulation in a desired uh, region, in a small region. And this allows you to sample at will, if you want, also unlikely regions like barriers, okay? You are not anymore uh, limited by Bolt the Boltzmann factor that tells you that you want to stay in the minima. If you add the parabola, which is sharp enough, you can, you can localize everywhere your system and collect samples. And then you can put back together the results from all, because you need many parabolas. You put the, all these results back together in a smart way, in a, in a, using statistics, basically, what is called weighted histogram analysis, uh, which just amounts to collect the data and uh, minimize the statistical error. And the important point here is that you want to remove the effect of the bias, okay? You, you want to access the equilibrium free energy. So you, you want to clean away the bias you, you put in. And this you can do easily because you know what you put in, okay? You know the shape of the bias. So in a nutshell, we have these two methods. And the real question here uh, for these methods and others as well is what is a good reaction coordinate, okay? What shall we use uh, uh, as a reaction coordinate for a given chemical reaction, for a phase transition, for protein-protein interaction, protein-drug interaction, so on? So no one knows. The, answer, the short answer is no one knows. You can try using heuristics, your experience, experience of the others. Uh, people now started also to try using machine learning. But the, the, the answer, the real answer is that no one knows. 
it's not, there is not a recipe, there is not a scheme, a theorem, something that tells you for your problem, use these variables, okay? It's, it's really a known situation because uh, it is crucial to have good variables, okay? It's really the, the most important ingredient in all these techniques is uh, uh, the variables that you can use, okay? The, 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 uh, to find the optimal variables. And this is a sort of a chicken and egg dilemma. Uh, it's, a, it's a paradigmatic one, I think. So you, you would like to, I, I mean, to define the best coordinate, you would like to have extremely good information, extensive information about the whole phase space of your system, okay? Including the transitions and so on. But this usually you get all these informations by using a good reaction coordinate. So you see, you need a reaction coordinate to explore well the phase space, but you need to know well the phase space to get a good reaction coordinate. So that's that's the difficulty, and, uh, and uh, I, I see no solution, uh, no real solution in sight for the moment. I, mean, I think it's really a hard problem. Uh, here I will skip maybe this slide. It's a technical point. It's just to reiterate the importance of collective variable. If you if you use a uh, I mean, depending on the variables you use and depending on the length of your simulation, uh, you can converge to different things, okay? It, it can be surprising, but uh, the result can be different. And it's not your fault. It's, the, it, it's due to the typical time scale of your system. You can have transitions across uh, directions which are not the, the direction of your reaction coordinate, so you cannot control them. So this is out of your control. Uh, you can converge to one thing, you can converge to another thing, you cannot converge at all. This is something is not often uh, spoke out uh, clearly, but it's an important point. Finally, there is a way in principle to get a perfect, so what, what is a perfect reaction card? Well, in principle, it's the committer. The committer is what? It's just the probability to end up in B or in A, for example, let's say in B, so in your product state, starting from a given configuration of the system. Here I'm speaking of the full uh, configuration space. So uh, this, is, this tells you the fate, you know, the, the evolution of your uh, configuration. And uh, if you have a configuration which is, uh, which is half the probability to go to B and half to go, go back to A, then you are uh, essentially, uh, uh, you are at a transition state. Okay, this is the definition of transition state. In principle, this committer probability, PB in this slide, this is the best reaction coordinate for several reasons that are explained in these reviews. Unfortunately, no one in the world can estimate the, the committer everywhere, right? You, you, you should uh, launch many simulations from any point in configuration space. This is completely absurd. I mean, no one in the world can do it. So this is impossible to use, unfortunately, but it can still be used as a benchmark, okay? You can test locally some configurations to determine the, the revolution. Now, let, let me come to the last part of the presentation. So. Basically, uh, in the past years, we tried to do some efforts to find the general ways uh, to define these reaction coordinates so that we don't have to, to specialize too much on a, on a specific reaction, on a phase transition, on a, a protein problem, I don't know, protein aggregation and so on. So we, we took inspiration from graph theory. Graph theory, it's an interesting uh, branch of mathematics which describes uh, networks, okay? It's very fancy and very, how to say, fashionable because there are networks uh, of all kinds, right? There are electric networks, social networks, uh, cellular networks, uh, metabolic networks, I mean, all sorts of networks. We can apply this also to atoms, so networks of atoms. And the idea is that we can describe any, any system in condensed matter with an adhesion matrix, which tells you essentially if two atoms are close by or not. Okay, to, to, to simplify a lot, we can define with a, with a proximity definition, I mean, of a, like a Fermi Dirac function. Uh, like, like in this slide, as a function of distance, we can decide a typical time, a typical length scale for uh, bonds. Uh, can be chemical bonds, hydrogen bonds, uh, Van der Waals interactions, and so on. And we can say if two atoms are close together, we switch on uh, uh, the, 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 a spot in the matrix. If they're far away, it remains white. This representation is very general. Okay, you can see as a network any system basically. Here, here are some examples, and then. We can try to extract uh, pertinent, uh, useful information about the transition, or in general about the structure of the system, by uh, analyzing these matrices. And here there is no single way to do it. Uh, in the years, uh, through the years, we tried different uh, possibilities, and I will show you just an, uh, an example because the time is limited. But the slides are, are, are uh, you, you will have the slides of this presentation, and uh, you have more details there, and uh, and you can ask me, of course, if you are curious. 
So the idea is let's extract the most useful information from these matrices. And uh, basically, uh, there are different ways, okay? As I said, I will skip a little bit because, uh, because uh, I'm a bit in a hurry. There is not a lot of time. Uh, you have some very brute uh, force, I to say, very, there are some ways to keep a little, really a lot of information from these matrix that are suitable for materials, for example. And we studied the uh, ice nucleation, for example, and phase transitions with this. There is a way which extracts just a single eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue of this matrix, exploiting the perron frobenius theorem. And that allows you to, to characterize well small clusters, for example, or molecules. So we use this for nanostructures, for transforming nanostructures, for example. But what I would like to show you now is a, is a collaborative work with Marco Saita, you know him very well, and Theo Magrino, who is a PhD student, uh, student working with us, which is really an application of these ideas to chemistry. Okay, to chemical reactions. So essentially we use this formalism. We define two variables, a progress variable S, which is a, a progress along a pathway between, uh, between, two, uh, between two states, uh, no, the, the reactants and products, the two end states of the transformation. And then we have another variable Z, which is uh, somehow the distance from the reference uh, structures so from these uh, endpoints, for example. In principle, we could have more than two, okay? We could have a lot of uh, structures in between, but then we, we, we would need to make a guess about the pathway. And in the beginning, at least, we don't want to make a guess. So imagine we have these two structures, and then we have a variable that interpolates between the two, and another one that tells us the distance from the two. And this interpolation is done using a, a notion of distance. We need a distance metric that tells us the generic structure, R of T, during a molecular dynamic simulation, how distant it is, how distant it is from uh, a reference structure, for example, reactant or product. And for this, uh, with Marco, we introduced the metric, which is uh, basically very simple. It's based on coordination patterns, okay? Coordination patterns are, are nothing else than this. You, you decide that uh, you have a number of atoms in your system that could undergo the, the transition, okay? You, you can take, for example, uh, all the atoms of the solute molecules, and then you consider their coordination with the, all the carbon, all the oxygen, all the nitrogen, all the hydrogen atoms in the system. And this can include also solvent, okay? This is the, cr the crucial point. So you end up with a coordination pattern, a table, let's say, for the reactants, one for the products, and you can describe the chemical reaction as this change of tables, okay? And then what do you do? Well, then you can do metadynamics, umbrella sampling. You, you can apply your preferred technique to to explore and to sample the free energy landscape. And you can switch from A to B. You can perform the chemical reaction in an efficient computational time, okay, in a short computational time. And the nice thing is that you can pass in a seamless way from gas phase to the liquid phase. Essentially, uh, you don't have to change much. You, you will have your matrices here, both for the gas or for the liquid phase. And uh, you will need to uh, essentially uh, include the solvent uh, into the definition of coordination numbers if you if you are in a solvent okay if you are in gas phase it's easier uh, you don't have to worry about the solvent but then uh, the solvent will be able to participate actively in the reaction and it will affect the mechanism it will affect the free energy barriers okay very often you find the uh, lower barriers when you have a solvent participation for example in water so this looks like a kind of a general technique right we we just have to define reactants and products and the system discovers uh, on itself uh, transition pathways, transition states, and using an enhanced sampling techniques, as I said, you, you can reconstruct free energy landscapes. We applied this approach to, to several problems so far. Here are a few of them. Uh, it's not a complete list, but we studied amino acid decomposition uh, in water, of course. We studied uh, hydrothermal uh, synthesis of nucleotides, which is a quite complicated problem because nucleotides which are the building blocks of uh, ARN or DNA, uh, sorry, RNA in, in English, ARN is in French. RNA or DNA, they are, uh, they are uh, relatively large objects compared to, I don't know, small formamide molecule. And, uh, and uh, here we wanted to check, for example, if uh, we can have in a prebiotic conditions, we can have a, a synthetic pathway that resembles what is today the biological pathway, the, the pathway uh, which is helped by enzymes. So this is an example, and then we compare with nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. Then we studied the, the synthesis of formic acid at a water mineral interface. So just to say that you can include the solvent, you can, you can also include the effect of uh, 
a solid interface, for example. And we, with colleagues in Prague, experimental colleagues in Prague, we also studied the formation of nucleobases. So you see here there are ingredients of uh, interest for prebiotic chemistry, okay? The, the building blocks of proteins, uh, uh, nucleic acids, I mean, uh, DNA and so on. Um, now, the last part, I don't know, I have a few minutes left, hopefully, uh, maybe. Almost finished. Okay, yeah, so I will- uh, to make you a sign. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know because I was checking the clock. Anyway, um, just a, the, the most recent example, it's a study by, which we performed with Thomas Grinoy, as I said, our PhD student. And it's a, it's a first attempt to simulate the whole Strecker uh, amino acid synthesis pathway. This is, as you see in this slide, it's a long pathway. It's a lot of steps in this chemical reaction. And it, it allows, in principle, to pass from simple precursor molecules, HCN, ammonia, formaldehyde, to glycine, okay? This is a, this is a curious because it's a, it's a mechanism that is invoked since uh, one century, maybe. It was invoked also by Stanley Miller in his uh, Miller experiment where he synthesized nucleotides spontaneously in water. But uh, actually, there, are, there is no systematic theoretical study of it. Okay, this is surprising, but uh, it's like this. Sometimes uh, things like this happen. So, okay, to make it short, we, we undertook this, uh, this long, uh, the study of this long chemical reaction, which is quite ambitious. This is the typical approach we use. We use the density functional theory based molecular dynamics. We, we choose a temperature, for example, ambient temperature. We have our organic molecules, uh, but uh, solvated with real water. So, I don't know, 80 water molecules. And we need long simulations, right? About four nanoseconds in this case, which we can do only, of course, using uh, millions and millions of, uh, millions of CPU hours on large computer facilities. This is how it looks like the system. We can get insight, as, of course, on transition states. So we can add a precise characterization of transi transition states and the role of water molecules, so the solvent. And then uh, we, we could achieve the, basically the, the reconstruction of the free energy landscape for all these elementary steps, okay? Uh, going from the simple molecules up to glycine. And this, uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, interesting for me because again, uh, we have many different steps, many different reactions, and we use a single definition of reaction coordinates. That's why I say uh, we try to have general definitions, right? So, so this, this seems to work well. In this study, like in others, so we, we get a good comparison with the experimental results. And uh, this is encouraging, okay? We get better barriers, for example, compared to gas phase studies in the past. So again, you get a better barrier, a lower barrier when solvent is taken into account. So all the signs point to a, uh, to a good, uh, re to good uh, reconstruction of the mechanisms and of the free energy landscapes. So I will close with the, leaving you this sl last slide. Uh, it's just a summary. Basically today we have many uh, ways of employing molecular dynamics to study complex uh, transition pathways, okay? And here I just make a small, uh, a small, a small selection. And this is rather well understood today, okay? The, the big picture is well understood. But then in reality, we want to pass to study kinetics. As I said, kinetics is very, very important to compare with experiments. And to do this, uh, well, the work is in progress in the sense that the, the scientific community has not such solid tools, uh, theoretical and computational, like for uh, studying equilibrium properties, free energies and so on. Uh, compared to this, kinetics is, uh, is still, uh, still to be studied and, uh, and uh, theory is still to be developed. So uh, I would like to end with this and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Fabio. Uh, uh, beautiful talk, even if I know everything. Uh, I'm always amazed by the clarity of your presentation, so this was great. Um, please let me, uh, the audience, uh, uh, take uh, five ask questions in the chat or vocally. Otherwise, as we will start. Uh, I, I, I have a question, maybe misplaced, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so, so you, you have kind of reaction paths and so on, okay, but what about quantum effects? Yes, uh, it's it just uh, how to say, uh, I, I guess you speak of nuclear quantum effects, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is not something I showed here. So basically, you see, my, my, my research is focused really on uh, exploring uh, the statistical mechanics of the phenomenon, the, the transition pathways and so on. If you get or not the nuclear quantum effects and, uh, and, and their importance and so on, this depends, first of all, if you, if you include them uh, in your uh, simulation, right? 
So uh, the basic, if you want, the basic tool is molecular dynamics. You can do classical MD, you can do DFT-based MD, you can do path integral maybe to include the nuclear quantum effects. So this is, a, this is an important point that you raise. <clears throat> In this example I showed, for example, the nuclear strike, the, sorry, the striker uh, pathway, we didn't consider them, even if we know that uh, proton transfer, for example, can be affected and so on. So the answer is uh, you can uh, use whatever engine you want to perform the dynamics, okay? You can include or not nuclear quantum effects. Uh, the things that I showed apply in any case, in the sense that in any case you have to explore uh, and to sample the, the, the phase space and uh, reconstruct uh, equilibrium properties and so on. Okay, okay. But you, you agree that there should be more and more effective if you consider lower and lower temperature, right? What should be more effective, sorry? And these quantum effects. Okay, you say you can include or whatever, but I mean, I could imagine that if you work at very high temperature, I mean, they are kind of washed out or whatever, but certainly not if I'm going to lower and lower temperature. Is it, is it correct? Well, usually, yes, I, I think, yes. It, it's not really my field, but yes. Uh, even if uh, Marco Saita and Michele Causula, for example, uh, they're working on, uh, on, uh, on nuclear quantum effects in uh, water, in water clusters, for example, and so on. And I think they pointed out that uh, you can have some, uh, some sizable effects even at not so low temperature, even close to room temperature. And, and this is also from experiments, I think, in liquid water and so on. So yes, in general, uh, at lower temperature is, uh, is more relevant, but, but you cannot, a priori, you cannot discard uh, even at room temperature. Also, for example, Ariel Warshall, a uh, Nobel Prize in, uh, in chemistry, studied a lot of enzymatic reactions and also in enzymatic reactions at, at the body temperature, you can have a nuclear quantum effects that promote proton transfer, for example. There are questions? Yeah, you, Marco, I have a question on, um, uh, on the last part you presented, Fabio, the, so the wall synthesis of uh, amino acids. So you said it's four nanoseconds of simulation, so, but how many different uh, transformation are you looking at in total? Yeah, so four nanoseconds is the total, uh, is the cumulative amount, right? Uh, for, uh, for, so here we have what, seven steps, I, I think. Well, something like uh, six or seven uh, reactions, okay. Okay, you and show I, all of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, these are all the, okay. all the, all the steps. And, um, and then uh, in practice, what do you do? So the, our protocol that, uh, that we are kind of happy with is the following. We first explore, as I said, the transition pathways, for example, with metadynamics. Then we do committer analysis to validate uh, the transition states and the, and, the, and the pathways and so on. And then we do umbrella sampling, uh, which is an intrinsically parallel technique. So you can use many, many computers at the same time if you want. And so, and, and then easily you have uh, tens and tens or hundreds of simulations running at the same time and, and you reach even a nanoseconds, which, which is rather it, large. It, it means you can use the wall supercomputer doing this, right? You, you can use what, sorry? The wall supercomputer doing this. In principle, yes, but okay. We, we are not the only ones using it. So the administrator would be not happy, but yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's an important point also for the students, maybe. Uh, I think we have to go more and more, well, it's an obvious thing to say, but we have to go more and more towards techniques which are intrinsically parallel that, that can, be, can, can allow to exploit a huge uh, supercomputer. Uh, some techniques are naturally parallel and others are not. And this can make a huge difference in your, in your life. I mean, in the end, maybe the, the total amount of CPU time is the same, but uh, in your own life, uh, you, you would like to see the result in one month and not in uh, 15 years, right? So, so this is a really important point also for method development. We, we should try to develop methods which can exploit these parallel machines. Um, there's a question from the audience in the chat. So it's from Igor Ramcevic, the routine way I'm reading. The routine way of doing this in computational chemistry is by looking for the energy of the transition structure and using the iron regression. This allows for, more systems, for small system sizes and is quite convenient. Could you compare the MD approach to this one? Yes, that's what we, that's we, what we did, uh, what we do kind of uh, systematically to compare with this in the sense that uh, in the gas phase, uh, first of all, in the gas phase, it's a bit easier to find the mechanisms often 
and uh, because there are less atoms involved simply. And, uh, and people often guess the transition state structure makes an hypothesis and then uh, there are standard techniques to find uh, at zero Kelvin the, the transition mechanism. And then as you said, uh, you, you can estimate the barrier. Usually it's an energy barrier, then you can try to estimate the free energy barrier by using some approximation to the entropy. And in the end, you can apply Irene formula to get the kinetics. It's, a, it's an exponential relation. Uh, now, there are a few, few problems in applying these to solutions in the sense that, uh, first of all, you, you cannot work at zero Kelvin solutions because it doesn't make much sense. So you need molecular dynamics, okay? This is the first point. Uh, then you can apply similar strategies. You can guess the transition, the transition state and, and find the barrier. What we do, we try not to guess. We try to let the, the simulation discover possible transition pathways and then we, we find the best one and, and, and we, we adopt that as our result. And in the end, we would like to apply also an I-ring relation to estimate the rate. Uh, the, the problem of the I-ring relation is that typically you need a prefactor which tells you the recrossings, which tells you the, the deviations from transition state theory. And these, uh, again, uh, it's not something you get easily without molecular dynamics. With molecular dynamics, you can get this, uh, also this transmission coefficient. So in principle, you can get uh, uh, very good uh, reaction rates as well but it is expensive and that's where we are doing some development now. So to, sum so to summarize, we compare with the traditional quantum chemistry at zero Kelvin. Uh, as I said before, uh, quickly, uh, often uh, adding the solvent, we find that the barrier is lower than the gas phase barrier. This is a good indication usually, a lower barrier, usually it's a better mechanism. And then uh, we can try to, comp to compare the rates as well using I ring, but again, it's not strictly correct. We should uh, estimate the transmission coefficient. Uh, we can have deviations from transition state here. So this is work in progress. And uh, today we cannot really, and I think it's difficult to say how to compute very precise rates for chemical reactions in solution. There are techniques, but uh, there is still development to do, in my opinion. Uh, yes, uh, let me uh, complete uh, what uh, Fabio just said, actually put here uh, a, a review that we wrote with Fabio and, and a former postdoc of ours uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, we, uh, as Fabio showed, there's um, um, a number of uh, applications that we did on uh, prebiotic chemistry origins of life, let's say. And we found out over the years, actually, the, the, one of the reasons why we thought we had something useful to say in this community is that uh, general calculations for these kind of problems were, uh, as Fabio said, uh, more traditionally, uh, more traditional quantum chemistry calculations, uh, uh, gas phase, zero temperature, which is good if you want to simulate the chemistry that could have occurred or could still occur in the interstellar space where temperatures are actually very, very small, very low. But it's uh, very difficult to combine with uh, hydrothermal chemistry and earth uh, solution chemistry that occurred in the primordial earth or in the famous prebiotic soup where temperature and solvent and all the other factors were a real uh, important uh, factor. Is if, uh, are there other questions? Uh, so, by the way, so that's why I put this poll red here in the in the chat for everybody. It's a good, I think, review of uh, different approaches from quantum chemistry to uh, to uh, ab initio molecular dynamics and enhanced sampling. Uh, uh, pretty much what uh, Fabio showed uh, earlier. And um, just a final comment on the fact that the, the final part of Fabio's talk is exactly what I mentioned yesterday in my talk about the Maestro consortium that we built here in. Uh, in Paris, precisely to uh, try to develop first the theory about how to uh, 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 infer uh, kinetics. And then, of course, hopefully, this will uh, lead us also to uh, numerical and computational uh, implementation. So I would say that it's 9.15 in Paris. So I would say it's time for a little break. Of course, as you know, coffee break is in, on the individual uh, scale. Uh, and so we we'll suggest to resume back here in 20 minutes. So 10, 10 in Paris and uh, uh, 10 past five in the afternoon in uh, Singapore. We we'll have the final two talks and then we'll uh, wrap up uh, these uh, three days. So see you in 20 minutes. And thank you, and thank you, Laura. Thank you.
Thank you.